Hi everyone, and welcome to part two of our energy management RSET series. You met me last time. My name is Natasha Sadoff. I'm happy to start our session again this week. Thank you for joining us in our second webinar. As a reminder, we'll have two more sessions after today's session on climate resilience. Part three will focus on NASA resources for renewable energy and building energy efficiency next week. On June 22nd, part four will talk about how to access data through the NASA Prediction of Worldwide Energy Resources Project, or POWER. As we talked about last week, we are sharing this information with you via four webinars. We'll have a presentation or demonstration followed by a discussion and question and answer session. We'll ask you to complete a knowledge check at the end of the series. If you participate in all four sessions and complete the knowledge check, you'll receive a certificate of completion from our set. In order to get the most out of the series, we recommend that you have taken the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing course available from our set. Last week, we introduced you to the energy sector and various challenges facing energy management. We also introduced you to the plethora of different variables and parameters available through the NASA-supported story map that Patel developed. This week, we're gonna talk more about a key challenge and application area, climate resilience, as it relates to energy management. We'll be referencing the various parameters and variables introduced last week throughout the rest of this series. Today, we'll be presenting an introduction to various climate, weather, and other environmental threats to the energy sector to set the stage for some real world examples. I'm going to set the stage, provide some background, then my colleague Meredith Fritz will talk through some real world examples on using NASA Earth observations in wildfire risk potential, electricity restoration post hurricane, and hydropower reliability monitoring. To get started, Let's talk about the important issue of climate resilience and the energy sector. You've probably heard the definition of resilience, but it's an important place to start. Resilience is the ability to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disruptions. For energy management in particular, resilience refers to the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions. We all want to ensure that we can access the electricity and the power that we rely on every day. Climate change has already had a significant impact on energy management, which we'll talk about, and energy infrastructure must be able to withstand any potential impacts to service, including more frequent and intense events. Compounding the challenge of climate change, energy infrastructure in many places in the world is aging, adding to vulnerabilities. Resilience efforts may be expensive, but benefit companies over time in that they can avoid large unplanned spending necessary during emergencies. Of course, there are also ancillary benefits or co-benefits to making these investments, including improved reliability overall and a more diverse energy supply. Let's talk more about what some of these vulnerabilities may look like so that we can get to the topic of addressing them using Earth observation data. First, infrastructure is vulnerable in several ways. Aging infrastructure may not be built to withstand current and projected hazards. Water shortages caused by drought or changing weather patterns may mean a lack of cooling water necessary for thermoelectric power plants. Power outages can occur when vegetation like trees fall on power lines or extreme weather events disrupt power supplies. Infrastructure design can also result in disruptions. Related to that, a lot of energy infrastructure is located in coastal areas where it's susceptible to extreme storms and subsequent storm surge or flooding, sea level rise, or other climate-related hazards. Beyond infrastructure, our energy supply may also be inadequate for the generation demand with climate change driving changes in demand, such as heat waves or extreme cold. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Energy management related staff may also experience challenges as they face the need for more training and how to manage and respond to emergencies or hazards. Compounded events or various climate extremes happening at the same time can also make response even more complicated. 
So what are some climate-related threats that impact the energy sector? We have a global audience, and I'm sure you all face different challenges in your regions of the world. Catastrophic events such as landslides, wildfires, hurricanes, monsoons, tornadoes, flooding, or other impacts of extreme storms can cause immediate and lasting damage. Gradual changes can also threaten the energy sector, as I mentioned a minute, a minute ago, in terms of changing water availability, like drought, resource availability, and energy demand needs changing over time. Now let's talk in a little more detail about a few examples. I'll describe each example and talk about mitigating factors, including where Earth observations can fit in. First, wildfires or bushfires are one of the most common threats to energy production, transmission, and distribution. Wildfires are projected to burn longer and over wider areas in many regions of the world. We've already seen this, particularly in the United States and Australia. Fire seasons are starting earlier, and if a human accidentally starts a fire, it can spread dangerously fast. In the U.S., some of the worst wildfires we've seen were started by accident. Many areas experiencing increasing wildfire risk are rural areas with growing populations as people move outside of urban cores. There are some important mitigators of wildfire and bushfire risk, including managing vegetation and protecting infrastructure. Drones can be used to collect real-time data on risk. Taking resilience into account may include reconsidering land use planning paradigms too. Hopefully you're already connecting where the NASA Earth observation data sets we presented last week can fit into these possible mitigators. For example, Earth observations can shed light on vegetation and land use. Hurricanes are another significant risk to energy management. In the U.S., the proportion of Category 4 and 5 storms is doubling and even tripling, depending on the region. This can result in dangerously high winds, flooding, and storm surge, which can damage infrastructure and interrupt service. Hurricane Sandy was the deadliest, most destructive, and strongest hurricane of the 2012 Atlantic hurricane season in the eastern Europe, U.S., inflicting almost $70 billion in damage and killing over 200 people across the Caribbean, U.S., and Canada. Storm surge from the hurricane hit New York City and flooded even subways, cu cutting power for approximately 8.5 million customers. There are various technology and infrastructure mitigators, but Earth observations can also support weather and climate monitoring and planning. Sea level rise and storm surge are other threats that can impact low-lying power plants and coastal infrastructure. More than 100 nuclear power plants are built just a few meters above sea level in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Climate change is accelerating sea level rise with more frequent storm surge. Again, there are various technology and infrastructure mitigators, and Earth observations can also support weather and climate monitoring and planning. Severe winter weather has impacted the U.S. this past year, but Europe has also been impacted by extreme cold and sudden increases in residential electricity demand. In February just this year, Texas faced historic snowfall and ice. Demand increased, but infrastructure was ill-prepared for the snowfall and ice that accompanied the freezing temperatures. Wind damage and blizzards can also result in damage to energy infrastructure. Blackouts can, can occur when infrastructure is damaged but also when the demand surges beyond capacity. Mitigators are also context specific. In Texas, there have been discussions on the need to link Texas's grid with others in the region to otherwise strengthen resilience of the grid. In Europe, discussions focused on maintaining a diverse energy portfolio so that various energy sources could withstand the increasing demand. Finally, improvements to infrastructure can help winterize in light of these winter challenges. Let's turn to another region of the world, the continent of Africa, where drought and aridification are already threatening hydropower generation. Hydropower provides an average of 17% of the electricity generation across the continent, but up to 80% in certain individual countries. Southern and Eastern Africa are expected to more than double their hydropower capacity by 2030. However, water availability is being impacted by aridification, drought, rising temperatures, changing precipitation, and increased climate variability. 
All of these changes are leading to increased potential for blackouts and energy shortages. For example, Cape Town faced water shortages for drinking and power generation from 2015 through 2018 due to a combination of the lowest rainfall since 1933, population growth, and challenges in water resource management. There are various mitigators related to policy and science, or soft measures, and technology or infrastructure, or hard measures. Regulations can help improve water resource management, incentivize resilience measures, and use models and data to predict changing weather and climate conditions in planning and financing for new projects. Hard measures could include increasing the reservoir capacity, activities for sediment control, and increasing the dam height. Earth observations can speak to all of those variables on weather, climate, and physical characteristics. Monsoons and typhoons are other significant threats to energy management and the energy sector, particularly in Asia. Over the past 40 years, typhoons have intensified up to 15%. Beyond obvious impacts to people's homes and livelihoods, monsoon-related flooding can damage energy infrastructure and cause blackouts. Changing monsoon conditions and annual weather patterns can also complicate energy generation and demand. For example, during the monsoon season, it's common to experience high winds, heavy rainfall and flooding, and lower temperatures. This can result in lower energy demand, but also high solar energy generation and higher wind energy generation. On the other hand, during the dry season, low wind and high temperatures are more common. And this can result in high energy demand, high solar energy generation, but low wind energy generation. So now to mitigators. Soft mitigators can include using models and data to predict weather and climate conditions or using policy, incentives, or regulation to improve management. A more diverse generation mix is an important mitigator to energy generation challenges. Combining power sources and using various technologies like pumps or batteries can improve resilience. Let's get to our last example threat, landslides. Landslides obviously happen all over the world, but I'll focus here on Latin America. With 56% of installed electricity generation capacity with renewable sources, Latin America has the world's cleanest electricity sector, but much of this depends on hydroelectricity, which has suffered from droughts brought on by climate change and in some cases, insufficient water resource management. In fact, Latin America and the Caribbean is the second most disaster prone in the region in the world. More intense rainfall can increase the risk of landslides, which impact energy generation and energy infrastructure, like power lines or hydroelectric sites. Excessive rainfall within short periods can easily overwhelm urban natural drainage systems, and landslide risk is highest in sloping terrains, often where inhabitants are underserved or vulnerable with limited access to essential services. It's important to note that all regions face these climate impacts in different ways. Though flooding and heavy rainfall are becoming more and more common in some parts of the region, other parts of Latin America are facing drought, which can also cause water shortages for hydroelectric power generation. Again, models and data can be used to predict risks and identify infrastructure at risk. A more diverse energy portfolio can also mean a more resilient energy portfolio. So we've talked through a lot of examples, but what does resilience actually look like? There are a lot of possible examples that we could go through here. First, the flexibility to reallocate resources such as staff, money, or supplies to build resilience proactively, prepare for and respond to the gradual changes over time, or respond to emergencies or extreme events as they happen. The point with resilience is to respond in a way to build back better, so that you're more prepared and resilient for the next event and therefore the impacts may not be as bad. A diverse energy mix with different energy sources and energy locations can also bolster resilience in systems. The use of microgrids and other activities like strengthening power lines and elevating sub substations can also help protect equipment. There are some existing examples of climate resilience efforts, particularly in terms of the hard measures that we've talked about. For example, the US utility Con Ed spread over, 
spent over a billion dollars improving their infrastructure after Hurricane Sandy. Florida Power and Light also did the same after Hurricane Wilma in 2005. There are other ways to improve resilience, like I've mentioned. You may have also heard me say that data for resilience planning, available, accessible, and actionable data, can be used to inform climate resilience decision making. We mentioned the importance of accessibility and actionability last week. In other words, data need to be accessible and able to be put to use within a decision making scale. Data must be in the appropriate temporal and spatial resolution, available in the appropriate data output type, sufficiently easy to find, to use, and to apply, and applicable or relevant to the decision making or the need at hand. Let's talk about more real world examples of how NASA Earth observations have been used with other data sets and analytical techniques to inform resilience decision making. I'm happy to pass the floor to my colleague Meredith Fritz for this next section on how NASA tools can be used to promote energy resilience. Before we pass to Meredith, let's do a quick poll. Okay. We're excited to hear real quickly from you all and see where you're coming from in your experiences. So let's see the first poll question. How resilient do you think the electrical grid is where you live? So please select one, very vulnerable, somewhat vulnerable, or resilient. Okay, last few seconds to enter in your response. Okay, interesting results that about half of you said somewhat vulnerable and then close to evenly mixed between very vulnerable and resilient. So it's always interesting. I know our participants are from all over the world. Uh, so it's, it's always interesting to see what different people think and kind of thinking about how all of this information can be put into practice depending on where you live and the status of resilience efforts and, and the grid where you live. So very interesting. Okay, let's see the second poll question. How often does resilience planning come up in your work? Please select one, never, occasionally, sometimes, often, or all the time. So we'll give you a couple seconds here to respond. Okay, let's see. So this is also pretty mixed with the majority 30% occasionally, 30% sometimes. <laughs> so we are always curious to see what kind of backgrounds our participants call in and, and where they work and what kind of backgrounds they have. So we hope that um, a good majority of you here will be interested in how all of these data sets can be put into practice in resilience planning. So. 7% of you all the time, and we hope that you're all gonna get something out of this. So we're excited to, to keep going and now talk about some real world applications. So um, let's continue. Thanks for participating. Okay, thanks, Natasha. Now that we have a basic understanding of what resilience looks like in the energy sector, let's get into some examples of how utilities or researchers have used Earth observations to improve energy management and resilience. While use of Earth observation data among utilities is not currently widespread, some energy companies are using Earth observation data to better understand threats to reliable transmission, plan investments in infrastructure, forecast weather conditions, monitor environmental health, and many other uses. Adding Earth observation data to a utility's decision-making toolkit is a way to engender a more holistic understanding of the conditions that can impact a utility service area. For example, PG&E, a US-based utility, has used NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory's INSAR data to measure land subsidence or sinking of the Earth's surface. In the realm of rural electrification, the India Lights Project has used historical nighttime lights data from NOAA as part of a suite of tools to monitor rural electrification programs over time. The Power Grid Company of Bangladesh has used ground-based data and satellite imagery to plan transmission routes. 
The imagery was used to find the optimal route for a transmission line and took into consideration fish habitat, urban areas, roads, and river crossings. Powerhive East Africa, a U.S.-based company that operates in Kenya, uses Earth observation data in their swarm tool to optimize microgrid site selection. This tool uses nighttime lights data from NASA's Black Marble product to identify customers and site potential microgrid installations. In the renewable energy sphere, India's Central Electricity Authority uses satellite imagery as part of their best practices to determine how land use and geology influence the environmental impact of hydropower projects. ISAHEN, Productive Energy of Colombia, uses satellite data to monitor environmental restoration efforts after construction projects. Specifically, ISAHEN mon monitors vegetation change in the area as part of their environmental management plan post-construction. Earth observation data can also be useful for determining locations for geothermal plants. Thermal infrared data, surface wavelength measurements, and gravity anomalies can all be used for geothermal siting. Kenya Electricity Generating Company uses these data along with seismic maps, surface geology information, and other data to identify geothermal hotspots. Grid management is another area in which satellite imagery can be used. The Central American Electrical Interconnection System regularly uses Earth observation data for environmental impact and geotechnical studies. For example, this organization used Landsat imagery to identify volcanic features in Nicaragua along a proposed route for a transmission line. Energisa, a Brazilian energy company, uses vegetation data to determine which trees near transmission lines need pruning. To do this, Energisa pairs satellite imagery with an algorithm and digital photogrammetry to estimate presence and height of trees near overhead lines. The use of Earth observation data increases the efficiency of Energisa's vegetation management efforts. Lastly, utilities have used Earth observation data for disaster risk reduction and response. Energisa also uses Earth observation data to retrospectively assess weather conditions that led to grid interruptions. For example, Energisa used temperature and cloud condition data from GO-16, along with wind data, to investigate an incident in which five transmission towers were overturned by strong winds. Energisa is using these data to predict similar weather events in the future and to assess which assets may benefit from hardening. Panama State Transmission Company, Empresa de Transmisión Eléctrica, uses NOAA data from the GO satellite to gather data on severe weather conditions. Data on soil and air temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure, wind speed and direction, and solar radiation have allowed for more automation of data processing at Panama's National Hydro Meteorological Network. Now, let's take a more detailed look at three case studies in which NASA Earth observation data was used to improve energy management. The first example we have for you today is a mobile-based fire alert system initiated in South Africa starting in 2004. ESCOM, South Africa's largest energy company, had traditionally detected an average of 70 to 150 line faults per year. A line fault occurs when an abnormal current is detected in an electrical system. ESCOM field supervisors were required to inspect each line fault that occurred. One of the primary causes of line faults was flashovers due to fire. Automated safety checks terminated electricity to the line if a sudden drop in the current was detected, and this led to service disruptions for power customers. ESCOM cleared vegetation from transmission pathways, but in a service area the size of Texas, it was not feasible to, pr to prune all vegetation that could burn. As such, ESCOM was seeking a way to alert field supervisors to a fire occurring near their transmission lines so they could take preventative action to prevent flashovers if needed. To do this, Dr. Diane Davies and her colleagues developed a mobile fire alert system that relied on Earth observation data to assess fire in ESCOM service area. Alerts were based on MODIS data from NASA and Meteosat second generation or MSG data from the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites. 
ESCOM wanted alerts to occur as near real time as possible. Active fire data from MODIS had longer latency than was actionable for ESCOM, so data was sent directly from the Aqua and Terra satellites to South Africa's Satellite Application Center. This direct data transfer decreased latency to one hour after satellite overpass. The MODIS active fire detection product uses an algorithm to detect mid-infrared radiation from fires. Each pixel of the data is assigned one of the following conditions, fire, non-fire, missing data, cloud, water, or unknown. A pixel designated as fire means that one or more fires have been detected in the center of the pixel. Active fire data was sent to the satellite application center four times every 24 hours. As discussed, ESCOM needed information more frequently than four times per day. This is where the Meteosat second generation MSG data comes in. The Severi sensor aboard the MSG satellite relays data every 15 minutes, but unlike the MODIS data has poor spatial resolution, one kilometer versus four kilometers. The research team paired geostationary or MSG data and polar orbiting instru instruments, the Aqua and Terra satellites, to develop a more complete picture of fire status in ESCOM service area. These data were paired with GIS data on transmission lines, roads, and other features of interest to ESCOM. The primary data selected for the fire detection algorithm were the thermal anomalies data from MODIS. These data were chosen because they have been validated for use in Southern Africa and are regarded as credible sources of information. Unlike MODIS, the MSG data did not include a built-in algorithm and one had to be created. After the data were set up, fire alerts started to go out to fire supervisors and the credibility of the data were evaluated. Field supervisors noted that there were initially a few false detections, but the algorithm was adjusted and no false detections were noted thereafter. Field supervisors also observed that they had not received alerts for fires they had seen in the field. The author cited multiple reasons this might occur. The fire may have been too small, not hot enough, or may not have burned long enough to be detected by MODIS, which again, only collects data four times daily. After this feedback, ESCOM and the researchers chose to rely more heavily on the MSG data. Stakeholder input was vital to improving the system over time. For example, field supervisors mentioned that the system would be more helpful if it indicated where the fire was happening relative to a specific pylon rather than a section of the grid, and this adjustment was implemented. In the first year of the program, line faults decreased by 35% although this decrease may not be attributable to the mobile fire alert system. However, ESCOM managers did report anecdotally that the system helped to decrease the amount of line faults. Staff also noted that alerts made them aware of fires when otherwise they'd have to wait until a line faulted to know there was a problem. Overall, this case study is an example of a creative and practical use of satellite imagery to mitigate a recurring problem faced by a utility. In 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated the island of Puerto Rico, knocking out power to the majority of customers and causing significant loss of life. As crews began cleanup and power restoration efforts, a team of NASA researchers sought to monitor electricity restoration using the Black Marble product, which measures nighttime lights. The Black Marble product allowed Dr. Miguel Roman and colleagues to overcome four main limitations of power outage data. Timeliness, because near real-time data is needed. Continuous data collection, consistent data collection across a large geographic area, in this case, across a whole island. And availability of data at the street level. The Black Marble product is cloud-free and corrects for a variety of parameters that are known to interfere with the validity of the data. The product combines nighttime VIRS day and night band radiances with a number of other values to limit the influence of extraneous effects on the data. The researchers used a high definition version of black marble, which I'll talk about later. Using black marble, the researchers found that there was an 80% reduction in nighttime lights during Hurricane Maria, the extent of which you can see in this image here. 
The authors also tracked power restoration efforts at the neighborhood level and found expected differences in time to power restoration. Rural, remote, and regions that were the most damaged were the last to have power restored. Denser neighborhoods had power restored more quickly than those that were less dense. These findings are consistent with Puerto Rico's standard protocol for power restoration after emergencies, which is prioritized based on population density. In fact, 90% of municipalities in Puerto Rico adhered to the standard protocol for power restoration, although the researchers did note that the standard protocol might exacerbate impacts on those who are most vulnerable. For example, less dense urban areas, which are home to those who tr with traditionally lower incomes, generally had power restored after higher density urban areas, which tend to be higher income. Also using black marble data, the researchers noted three distinct phases in the recovery effort, which can be seen in this image here. The first phase was the immediate damage assess assessment period after the hurricane. Stage two was the relief efforts led by FEMA and the US military. And stage three was the recovery effort led by PREPA, the state utility, and the US Army Corps of Engineers. The red line, indicates the percent of energy restored according to black marble, and the black line indicates the same metric according to the state utility. The research team found that the average difference between these two metrics was 17.9% across the 195 day period. Some level of difference is expected. For example, if generators or grid electricity was provided during the day, but not at night, this would lead to discrepancies. Also, power restoration to streetlights will appear in black marble data, but not official reports. Overall, the authors demonstrated that nighttime lights can be used to monitor electricity restoration efforts after a natural disaster. The satellite data used by black marble is beneficial for utilities because it is collected automatically and requires no on the ground effort or reporting by crews or energy customers. Nighttime light data via black marble is available globally and has fairly coarse resolution. A high definition version of the product, like the one used for these analyses, is in the works and will be available via Google Earth Engine. The high definition product will enable users to access nighttime light data at the neighborhood level. At this time, high definition imagery is available only upon request. For more information, refer to the RSET training specifically on black marble. In Malawi, droughts, delays in the rainy season or flooding can lead to load shedding, brownouts, or blackouts due to the nation's almost exclusive reliance on hydropower. In this example, Dr. Giacomo Falchetta and colleagues sought to develop a model to predict the impact of wet and dry extremes on electricity use in Malawi. To develop the model, Falchetta and colleagues used a machine learning approach paired with satellite imagery to fill gaps in ground-based data. The model was then used to predict how changes in the water level in Lake Malawi, seen here, and subsequently in the flow of the Shiri River, affected electricity usage via a nighttime lights proxy. The model that Falchetta and his colleagues developed is shown here. Satellite data were gathered to determine a predicted value for the water level in Lake Malawi. Data used in the model included precipitation, land surface temperature, soil moisture, and evapotranspiration. The researchers chose to use NASA data specifically because there was no alternative for open source hydrological data that was available for Malawi. Once data were consolidated using Google Earth Engine, the first step was to conduct random forest modeling, the purpose of which was threefold. First, to gauge consistency in the remotely sensed data, Second, to fill data gaps across the time series. And third, and most importantly, to ascertain the predictive power of these parameters on the level of water in Lake Malawi. The results of the random forest modeling were validated GIS layers and satellite observations. In the second step, the researchers took the level of water in Lake Malawi and combined it with precipitation and evapotranspiration data from across the Shiri River Basin. In addition, these data were supplemented with gauge measurements at three points in the Shiri River. 
This resulted in a predicted flow of water in the Sherry River, or the simulated discharge time series. Using these time series data, the discharge deviation was determined which is the difference between the daily observed discharge and the long-term average discharge for each month at a given station on each day. In parallel, the research team developed metrics for what constituted a dry and wet extreme, since there is no standard definition. They decided that a discharge deviation below and above the 5th and 95th percentiles would constitute a wet and dry extreme, respectively. And this metric has been used elsewhere in the literature. Next, beta, beta regression modeling was run to determine the impact of the discharge deviation on the total hydropower operating capacity. The result of this modeling was the predicted hydropower capacity factor, or how often a plant is running at maximum power. A typical hydropower capacity factor is 40 to 50%, although this varies based on the capacity and the size of the plant. Lastly, the relationship between incidence of extreme discharge events and nighttime lights was assessed using log linear regression modeling. Now let's take a look at the results of the model. The model predicted that dry extreme events would lead to a 9.4% decrease in hydropower capacity factor when compared to the long run average hydropower capacity factor calculated for the same month. During these dry extremes, nighttime lights in urban areas were predicted to decrease by 31%. No adverse effects due to wet extremes were detected. The researchers were also able to validate the satellite-derived measurements of water level in Lake Malawi to actual measurements. They found that satellite data from Topex, Poseidon, and Jason had almost full explanatory power of the water level in Lake Malawi. Tenfold cross validated training accuracy and test accuracy were both above 0.99. Additionally, the authors measured how well their predicted value of flow in the Shiri River matched up with three field gauges, which we can see here on this slide. Cross validated training and validated accuracy for these three sites was 98.7 and 99% at site one, which is A and B. 97.3 and 94.5 at site two, or C and D here, and 90.6% and 89% at site three. These results show that, sh that the Shiri River flow was successfully predicted using only satellite and other or open source data. This modeling approach could be applied to areas where field data are scarce or if there are large gaps in the time series. It's important to note that the model did fail to predict extreme spikes in flow and is safest to apply to lower bound values. And you can see that in these orange spikes here. Earth observation data has the potential for widespread use in energy management and future developments of these data will make satellite imagery even more actionable for utilities. More and more data are moving to open access formats and NASA is working to make procuring data easier for all. Additionally, platforms like Google Earth Engine allow algorithms to be applied to satellite imagery and are free to use. In addition, hyperspectral imagery or imagery that captures a wide spectrum of electromagnetic wavelengths is growing in popularity because of its wide reaching applications. Hyperspectral data is three dimensional and can provide much more detail about a geographic area than two dimensional data. Machine learning can be used to increase the predictive power of satellite data and may aid in forecasting or risk scenarios. Additionally, more private companies will be putting satellites in orbit or offering analysis services to end users. As we speak, drones are being used to collect data closer to the ground and to monitor remote areas of trans transmission lines for vegetation management. Lastly, Earth observation data will be increasingly used to monitor the impacts of climate change on our planet and to mitigate its effects. Some examples of this are use of satellite imagery to site renewable energy installations or to monitor buildings' electricity consumption to ensure they're operating at high efficiency. We'll learn more about these applications in our next two sessions.
These case studies showed us examples of ways that satellite data can be used to improve operations of utilities, monitor post-disaster recovery, and predict threats to reliable generation. However, there are gaps and limitations of satellite data that should be considered. Access to real-time and long-term perspective data is something that utilities would find useful. Additionally, tools that predict risk would enable utilities to better understand conditions that may lead to adverse events. Data at finer resolutions that have lower latency and are provided more frequently will improve usability. One of the main challenges utilities face is vegetation management over large service areas. Products or tools that make vegetation management easier are in high need. Lots of satellite data can be found for free online. However, some data may be cost prohibitive for utilities. Also, if a utility is looking to create an algorithm that uses data, this will require in-house skills or resources or may need to be contracted out to a third party vendor. Lastly, we are hoping that trainings like this one increase awareness of how satellite imagery can be used in energy. Connections between imagery providers and utilities, including training infrastructure, will allow for increased societal benefit from these data. And now we'll close out today's session. In sum, we've learned that the need for a resilient energy infrastructure will only increase as the climate changes. We also learned about vulnerabilities that the energy sector is facing and ways that utilities can prepare themselves for extreme events. Lastly, we learned how satellite data is and can be used to prepare for emerging threats and to manage day-to-day -day utility operations. Here's some contact information if you would like to reach out. Our study director for the Battelle team is Natasha Sadoff. Anna Prados and Brock Blevins are the RSET training coordinators. The story map that we referred to in part one of our training can be found at this link. And the Electric Power Research Institute also put together a report on remote sensing and data analytics for electric utilities that you might find useful. And if you would like to take a closer look at some of the case studies that we talked about today, here are the detailed references. Now we'll move in to the question and answer portion of our presentation, but I do want to remind you to attend parts three and four of this training. The next speakers will share about the Power Project, which already has hundreds of thousands of users and is one of the most popular NASA tools. You'll learn about NASA resources for renewable energy and building efficiency applications, as well as how to access data through power. And we're very excited about those two trainings, and we hope you are too. All right, we're sharing the document here in just a second. Go through some of your questions. So question one, changes in land use can also affect biomass as a source of energy, which perhaps could be identified from observations. Further, can you elaborate as to how movement of biomass could be observed and such transported biomass can be quantified? In other words, the dynamics of biomass movement compared to static biomass standing stocks. So that's a really interesting, great question, great first question. Um, and I guess the short answer is that I think there are there is a lot of research available on this topic um, in various parts of NASA as an organization and an agency and various labs and various researchers um, looking at vegetation, carbon stocks, forests, or agricultural related metrics. Um, I think at a high level, there's Landsat imagery, NDVI, which is the Normalized Distribution Vegetation Index, I believe, or it's a measure of greenness agricultural data um, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture for U.S. related data, um, also for ground-based data on forest resources from the U.S. Forest Service, and I'm sure that there's ground-based data from similar agencies and ministries across the world. So uh, we've provided a few examples here of some of the work that NASA has done developing, for example, a biomass product 
based on estimates of a, above ground terrestrial vegetation biomass and carbon storage in the US. Um, in another study, NASA has developed maps of forest canopy height, also distribution of branches and leaves within the forest to understand biomass and carbon, carbon storage um, within forests. Um, there's also, yeah, there's sensors and there's other ground-based data that they incorporated into that work looking at canopy height. Um, and then finally, another study is, is looking at biomass products um, from satellites as well. So I think we can do a little bit more work to see about movement. These are forest, more forest um, centric products, but I think agricultural, um, you know, vegetation and, and agricultural waste is, is also an interesting source of biomass around the world. So I think we can continue to add to that question. It's a great question. Question two. What is the approximate delay in real-time data asking for potential applications in assessing and predicting forest fire trajectories? So we had a question about this last week as well. Um, and if you remember, we talked about data latency, which is how long it takes for the data to be available after it's captured with the satellite. That varies by product um, and by data set. The firm's product, which is VIRS and MODIS active fire data, distributes near real-time active fire data within three hours of satellite observation. So that's why the key there is it's near real-time. Um, that within three hours is, is very useful, but it's not necessarily useful for real-time active fire monitoring. Um, so we included there a link. Um, to understand data latency. Um, I think maybe we can also include a link on firms if you, if you haven't seen that already so that you can explore more. Um, there is some work predicting forest fires and that you know, can include a combination of the historical NASA data that's available. MODIS has a very long data record um, combined with meteorological data, ground-based data. So there's there's a lot of research that's available on um, predictions of, of forest fire trajectories, but FIRMS provides that um, three-hour near real-time active data, active fire data. Um, question three, can you please share a link to the R code on slide 26? So we provided a link here to the code that's available on GitHub. And so again, we are very appreciative of the researchers who um, are happy to, to share their work and to share with you. And so we, we included the contact information and the, the reference for this research on, um, I believe that was in Malawi, so we encourage you to, to also um, look at their work and, and read more about their research. Question four. Um, and Meredith, if, if you had anything to add, sorry about that um, question three, feel free to, to jump in. Did you want to add anything? Uh, no, thanks, Natasha. Um, but on the GitHub site, uh, there's the Python code and the R code. Um, so that should all be there for you to check out. Great, thank you. So question four. What is the role of utilities in the geotechnical field? Um, so we put a little information here about understanding the composition of soil, rock, earth materials, for infrastructure siting, for route planning, um, and then soil moisture data from the SMAP instrument can be useful here <clears throat> for understanding those parameters. Um, this is also an area where hyperspectral imagery can be used. Question five, are there any specific applications on the oil and gas sector um, through Earth observation or EO data? So NASA has a methane source finder that includes methane data sets, and we included that link here. There are also sensor solutions that are available, um, applicable to the oil and gas industry. NASA has a transfer or a technology transfer program, so we included um, that link as well. Hopefully that's of interest to you. If you have other specific questions, please feel free um, to post those and we can, we can also follow up uh, with more details. 
Question six. Do you see other concrete applications of machine learning for assessing electricity restoration efforts? Um, that's another great open-ended question. So um, there are several case studies that can be applicable here, and it looks like we will definitely do some more research to add to the um, to add to the response so that we can provide you more details. But the, at least the first link does have some interesting examples that you might take a look at, but we will add more before we share this Q&A document. Um, question seven, has NASA Earth observation data been used for monitoring seismic activity? Um, so NASA data has been used for monitoring the impact of earthquakes, uh, which is slightly different. So the NASA Advanced Rapid Imaging, uh, imaging and Analysis um, tool uses radar and optical remote sensing, GPS, and seismic observations to uh, better understand earthquakes. So with ARIA, maps of an earthquake can be made within a day to several days, depending on the availability of the earliest post-earthquake radar observations. It looks like we are still answering some of these. So question eight, what are the most effective remote sensing methods that have been used for plant productivity analysis? So NASA's primary production products are designed to provide an accurate regular measure of growth of terrestrial vegetation, including net primary productivity and gross primary productivity, and these products come from MODIS. So we provided a link um, for you to access those products um, directly from, from NASA, from MODIS. Question nine, which one, oh, let me scroll down. Question nine, which one is the best source to monitor soil moisture? What is the soil depth of the satellite, the satellite measure? So SMAP and GRACE are sources of soil moisture data, and I'm sure we can probably include the links there as well as uh, where you can access those data and find more um, information. So we'll add those, and then we will research that question on soil depth. Um, I know that's available. We just want to get you the right information. So we will add that. Um, we'll add that to the response before we share the document. So I'm glad to see we have more questions coming in. Um, question 10, it looks like we're in the process of answering. <laughs> Meredith is typing away. Thank you, Meredith. <laughs> so the question is, can, nighttime, can night, nighttime lights, I think is what they mean, alone be a source for identifying whether an area is electrified or not? Um, so no, nighttime lights alone are not sufficient to tell whether an area is electrified or not, um, but it's a very useful proxy. Um, for example, generators that run at night may make an area look electrified. Um, so it's, it, it is a good indicator. It's been used, um, the imagery has been used for all sorts of um, rural electri electrification projects, including um, post-disaster events like what we talked about today in our session. So it's a super interesting source of data. Um, there's a lot of ongoing research on assessing electrification um, and access to energy. So this is, it's a very um, up and coming area that Nighttime Lights is, is leading in, in research. Um, so question 11, and I think for all of these questions, we will go back, like I said, and add more links so that you can continue to research on your own as well and have access to where this information can be located. So question 11 is a great question. How reluctant are energy companies to adopt Earth observation data? So um, I think we've seen a lot of different things here. So as you can see, some utilities are already using satellite data and including at very advanced levels. 
some are not. Um, some of the larger utilities in the United States have teams of analysts and engineers who are using satellite data. They may be collecting their own drone-based data. They may be purchasing um, very fine resolution data from the private sector and combining all of these data sets to run their own analyses to, to develop their own um, forecasts and predictions. So some are very, very advanced. Other utilities in the US and obviously around the world as well are smaller and are looking for more off the shelf products that they can just utilize um, without that entire team of analysts behind them. So it's it's very um, diverse in how, um, how entrenched the use of earth observation data is among utilities. Another question that comes up a lot is the question of uncertainty, validation. Um, so this is something I think as um, utilities and really as data end users in any sector better understand earth observations and better understand um, what they can offer, what they can't, better understand you know, what the resolution of the products is, the historical record, all of the metadata, as those things are better understood, we think that the use of earth observation data will continue to increase. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty um, of how much data can be actually put into practice in that kind of a business setting. Um, so that's what we hope that trainings like this will start to increase that awareness and help um, organizations like energy companies better use, utilize Earth observation data. Question 12. Is there an application of remote sensing data in the marginal soil field? Um, so we are seeing here land use data from MODIS and VIRS. Um, Landsat imagery can be used in the marginal soil field. It looks like we're still providing some information here. So we'll continue to get you more data, uh, more information, some links so that you can um, explore what NASA has available on this question. Question 13. Are there resources for the applications of remote sensing in geothermal energy? So it's great to see some of these questions on, on biomass, on geothermal energy, on oil and gas. Um, these are really great questions. Um, so the, the answer here, satellite thermal imagery or imaging can be used for measuring and monitoring changes in geothermal areas. Um, there is a, a lot of research about the use of remote sensing for this application. Um, but like a lot of energy applications, there's not one specific NASA product that can be used in this area. So I think we can add a little bit more here um, and, and include some links as well when we share the document. Um, applications of SAR data being used for energy management. So I think we'll, we'll get an answer to you um, before we share the document, we'll research that as well. I believe that yes, there are, but we'll we will get back to you with that. Um, it looks like we still have a few questions. Oh, I'm glad to see we've got lots of questions, but we don't necessarily have answers yet uh, since they're coming in real time. So um, we will we're going to be very happy working on finding these these answers. Um, Com yeah, simplifying complexity, that'll be a great question to answer. Another question on black marble, analyzing forest fires at night, that's a great question as well. Um, another question on forest fires, um, smoke, um, machine learning techniques supported by Google Earth Engine. I know we have some information we can add on that. Um, 3D models of cities in Latin America to evaluate shadows and radiation received by roofs to install photovoltaic modules. Products to help with that. That's a good question as well. Um, we'll find answers on that. Lightning strikes. Um, yes, I think that's, we do. There are NASA satellite products specifically on lightning predictions. That's an interesting question that we'll provide more details and links um, on that. 
Nuclear power plants are highly dependent on water availability. Um, is there a NASA product or research on the risk of water availability for nuclear power plants? Yes, so we mentioned that today briefly, um, the need for water for nuclear power plants for um, cooling energy systems. And so there are a lot of products that have to deal with water availability. Um, there's a section on this in the story map that we've been referencing. Um, so that's a good place to start. And we'll add other links here as well on, on some of the various products that are available. Um, and it looks like the last question so far is remote sensing applications for the observation of migratory bird patterns. So uh, that we can probably find um, I'm not sure about that, but we can probably find uh, find something there as well. So a few questions, like I said, that we will continue to research throughout the day before we share this, this document. Um, if there are any other questions, we encourage you to post them in the chat and, and we'll add them to this document and post this document later once we're able to fully answer all of the questions here. Um, anything that my colleagues want to jump in and add to? We still have a little bit of time, but um, I think we'll, we'll probably have to do some research for you. But anything that anyone would like to jump in and add? Um, regarding the birds, it looks like Landsat imagery has been used to monitor bird migration patterns. Um, so we'll um, find some more information on that and plug it in here. Thanks, Meredith. Right, any final comments we'll make sure to capture in this document. We very much appreciate all of your questions and we very much appreciate you, you calling in and joining us on this training. So again, next week, um, Paul Stackhouse and his team from NASA Langley will be telling us more specifics on power, which will be focused on renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, building efficiency, solar, wind. So we encourage you um, to, to Tune in for a deeper dive on those issues. Um, weeks one and two, where we wanted to keep somewhat high level, since this is the first training on, on um, Earth observations for energy management. So it's a great introduction, we hope, and, and we'll be able to dive into more detail on those topics next week. Um, we hope that in the future, there could be additional trainings offered on some of these other topics that these questions are, are hitting on. So we hope that you'll pay attention for when other opportunities are available. So thank you. I think maybe we can end here um, so that we can go and, and research your questions and then share the document back with you. The document from last week, the Q&A, is available on the project website, on the um, RSET website that I believe was provided in the chat earlier, but it's, it should be the page where you registered. You can access the presentations, the PowerPoints, and the Q&A responses. So this one will be, will be posted as well, um, probably later today. So thank you all. I think we can probably end a little early. I'll give my colleagues one more chance to, to have any final thoughts. Otherwise, very much appreciate you participating. Any final thoughts from my colleagues here on, on the organizers line? All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Please pay attention for the Q&A document and we look forward to hearing again, um, joining for next week. Have a great day and we'll talk to you next week.